Welcome to this video on Bernoulli's equation. In this lecture, we're going to derive Bernoulli's equation. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the assumptions that go into it and how you would use Bernoulli's equation in practice. We'll do separate videos for examples dealing with Bernoulli's equation. So let's go ahead and first take a look at a little motivation for using Bernoulli's equation. So if you take a look at your screen here, you'll see we have a picture of a race car and it's off the ground. It's not supposed to be like that. Um, normally they don't want their cars to fly off the ground, they want it to stick to the ground. In fact, they do several design features to keep the, the car on the ground. One of which you'll recognize right away is a wing shape here. It's actually a wing that creates lift acting downward on the tires rather than you know a, an airplane wing that would have lift acting the upward so that the airplane stays up in the sky. This one actually is oriented so that the lift acting on the, the wing is pointed downward to keep the uh, rear of the vehicle on the ground. But there's another feature on here that's a little less, um, little less obvious. When they design these race cars, I'm gonna to try to draw a race car from the side here. So there's my race car. It's not a very good drawing, but the bottom actually, instead of being flat, they'll actually design the bottom of these things with a little bit of curvature on this. So here's the road. And the idea is that when you have airflow going underneath the vehicle, you have this change in area down here at the bottom so that the area gets a little smaller. Well, from conservation of mass, assuming that the air behaves as an incompressible substance, the velocity through that bottom part will be a little bit larger. So the velocity here, let's call it V2, is going to be larger than the velocity at 1 because of conservation of mass. Just the area there is smaller, so the velocity has to go up if the fluid's incompressible. And what you'll see from the lecture today is from Bernoulli's equation, that also means that the pressure here, P2, will be less than P1, where P1 is the pressure out uh, in front of the vehicle. So from Bernoulli's equation, you'll see that the pressure has to go down when the velocity goes up. What that means then is that the pressure is low in this region, and you still have P1 or atmospheric pressure pushing down here on the outside of the vehicle, but now you have a smaller smaller pressure in here pushing upward, and so you get a net downforce acting on the vehicle. And that net downforce allows the car to stay pressed against the, the ground, and so it's, it, um, it's less likely to come off the ground as it's shown in the photo here. So that's a design feature that they build into these vehicles so that they don't have to, they get better handling. In fact, they want to press the car down onto the, the ground as much as possible so that the car can corner a lot better. It can take a corner faster without sliding because the frictional forces will be larger because you have a, a larger normal force. So anyway, that's one kind of interesting application of using Bernoulli's equation here. So we're gonna go ahead through the lecture. We're gonna derive Bernoulli's equation. We'll talk about some of the assumptions and I'll mention a, a, a few little things about how you would apply Bernoulli's equation. So let's go ahead and get started. So we can get to Bernoulli's equation a couple of different ways. One is through the first law of thermodynamics, but we're gonna take a different approach here. We're going to use the linear momentum equation along with conservation of mass. And we're gonna apply it to this control volume that's shown in the figure here. It's just a small control volume. Before we go through this complicated picture, let me go ahead and mention a few assumptions that we're going to make during this derivation. So assumptions. First assumption is that we're going to be dealing with a steady flow. That means that we're not going to get changes with respect to time. Secondly, we're going to assume that the flow is incompressible. So we don't have to worry about changes in density. Now both of these assumptions can be relaxed. In fact, there are forms of Bernoulli's equation that are for unsteady flows and some that are for compressible flows as well. But for our purposes, we're going to just make these assumptions because that's, that's how we're going to use Bernoulli's equation for the most part in this course. Now there is a third and very important assumption, assumption and that's that we're dealing with inviscid flow. That we have no viscous forces involved. That's a key part of Bernoulli's equation. All the different forms of Bernoulli's equation assume that you have inviscid flow. So there are no viscous stresses that we have to worry about. And that'll be reflected in our free body diagram. So those are the assumptions we're gonna work with. Let's take a look at our, our free body diagram on a little piece of fluid. So the picture here is we've got some streamlines 
I'm just showing two of them here, but there are actually a bunch of streamlines that form a stream tube. You can imagine this forms sort of a cylindrical shape in three dimensions here. And we're only going to worry about flow going through that particular stream tube. So we know from our discussion of streamlines in a previous lecture that there's no flow through a streamline. The flow is only tangential to the streamline. So we don't have to worry about flow going across the streamlines. So whatever flow comes in through the bottom left here will be the same flow going out through the upper right. We're going to say that this direction along the streamline, we're going to call that the s hat direction. So I'll just draw that up here, s hat. That's just a unit normal vector showing us which direction the streamlines are in. Now, we're going to assume that this little control volume that I've drawn here is, is very short. We're going to say it has a length ds, just a short distance in the streamlines direction. And we're going to say that in the middle, the cross-sectional area of this little control volume is A. So if we move this distance in the positive s hat direction, some small distance, the area can change a bit. So the area of this face will be A, the area we started with, plus 1 half dA. Why 1 half dA? Well, if I say that the, the total change in area from the bottom left to the upper right is dA, well then half of that change occurs as I go from the center to the right. So that's why I get the 1 half. And dA just means that it's changed a small amount. Similarly, on the bottom left-hand side, the area there is going to be A minus 1 half dA, the minus sign because it's gone down a little bit as we go to the left. So we have small change in area from the inlet to the outlet. We'll say that the angle of this control volume with respect to the horizontal is theta. And that angle could change a little bit. We actually won't make use of that change in angle. Um, all we care about really is just this theta. We'll say that the velocity of the flow coming in at the, or the velocity of the flow at the middle will be v. So the velocity of the flow on the left hand side will be v minus one half dv and it'll be v plus one half dv on that side. Again, to allow for some changes in velocity. We'll say that the pressure at the middle is p. So the pressure in the bottom left is p minus one half dp the upper right, it's P plus 1 half dP. So the pressure force acting on this bottom left face will be the pressure there times the area there. So that's the blue P minus 1 half dP times A minus 1 half dA. And you have a similar thing in the upper right. Those pressure forces act inward on the surfaces. We also have a pressure force that actually acts on the sides all the way around on the side of this control volume. So that pressure force will be the pressure, the average pressure over the side, which will just be P. It's the, if the pressure over here is P minus 1 half dP and over here it's P plus 1 half dP, then the average pressure will be P along the side. And the difference in area in the S hat direction, oops, excuse me there. The difference in area between the right hand side and the left hand side will be dA, right, because it's 1 half dA here and a minus 1 half dA there, so the total change in the area will be dA. And the pressure force then acting over the sides will be P times dA. It's a little hard to see in that picture, but if I redraw it and exaggerate it, let's say this is what our control volume looks like. Here's the P dA. If I just say that the area here is A and the area over here is A plus dA, you can see that the force in this s hat direction will just be this kind of area that's, uh, I've, I've done a poor job of drawing this, but it's the annulus, um, it's just the dA, the difference in the area from the right to the left, right? And that'll be the pressure force acting on the sides toward the right hand side. It's like the projected area if you look in the s hat direction. So that's what that p dA is, and that's acting in the s hat direction. We also have a body force, and that's the density times the volume. The volume will be ds times a times gravity. So that gives me the weight acting downward. So we now have our free body diagram. We've drawn some pictures showing uh, the direction of the flow and the um, direction of the flow and the geometry and such. Let's go ahead and apply conservation of mass to that control volume. So conservation of mass. We'll go ahead and write it out and then simplify it. So this first term is, that's the time rate of change of mass within the control volume. And then we have their second term, 
rowurl.da. That's the net flux of mass out of the control volume through the control surface. Add those together, that's zero. This first term is going to be zero because it's steady. That was one of our assumptions. So we don't even have to worry about that particular term. The second term, we only have to worry about the flow through the upper right hand side and then the bottom left hand side. So let's start with the bottom left hand side. So there we'll have the density rho. The velocity there will be v minus 1 half dv. That's in the positive s direction. So here's the v minus 1 half dv pointing in the positive s hat direction. So that's positive. And then we multiply it by the area, or actually dot product it with the area. Notice that the area is pointing in the opposite direction. Let me go ahead and sketch the aerial normal vector. This is the outward pointing unit normal vector for that area. And notice that that outward pointing normal vector is in the negative s hat direction. So as when I do the dot product between the velocity and the area, I'm going to get, uh, let me change the color there. It's going to be a minus a minus one half dA. Again, the minus sign out front here is because it's pointing in the minus s hat direction. So this is what's happening on the left hand side. This is the mass flow rate coming, the net mass flow rate out through the left hand side, and it's negative because it's actually coming in. All right, now let me go ahead and take a look at what's happening in the upper right hand uh, face. So there we'll have our density times the velocity there, v plus one half dv. And that's in the positive s hat direction. And then the area there is in the positive, the, the normal vector, let me draw that out. The normal vector for that area is in the positive s hat direction. So that will be a positive a plus one half. Oops, let me change the color again. a plus one half dA. There is no mass flow through the sides because the sides are streamlines, so you don't have to worry about that. Right? So it's only flow coming in from the bottom left and flow going out through the upper right. So we can now go ahead and simplify that equation, keeping in mind that the density remains constant because we said that the flow was incompressible. I won't go through all the, the detailed algebra involved here, but I will say that the densities cross out and then you'll get higher order terms. Terms like uh, so a higher order term, H-O-T, would be things like um, dV times dA. That kind of uh, term will be much, much smaller than, let's say, like a dV term times an area. Notice that this one has an extra d in it. So this is very, very small in comparison to this term because it'll have a much smaller term. So these kinds of terms where you have you know, dV, dA, that'll be smaller than you know, ADV or anything with a single differential in it because it's their higher order terms. So those kinds of terms you can neglect. You can see that those show up here. You know, you have a DV times a DA, DV times a DA. They, they become very small. So when you go through the math of this and simplify, we'll end up getting VDA is equal to minus ADV. So this is what we get from conservation of mass. Now, when you look at that expression, it's not all that useful by itself. We need to do something more to make it useful. So the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to use the linear momentum equation. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here we're going to apply the linear momentum equation in the s direction. So let's go ahead and write it out. So we have our first term, ddt, integral over the control volume of u s is rho dv. That term is the time rate of change of s linear momentum. So the, the, the linear momentum directed in the streamline direction. And so we're going to see how that linear momentum within the control volume changes with time. Plus the net flux of s linear momentum out of the control volume through the control surface. That's what this second term is. So that's s linear momentum out of the control volume through the control surface. Then we have body forces in the s direction and surface forces in the s direction. This form of the linear momentum equation is using an inertial frame of reference. I should have mentioned that up here. If you look at this coordinate system, 
it's we're going to say that it's fixed to the ground so we don't have to worry about any acceleration terms anything like that so this one's just fixed so that's the form of our linear momentum equation this first term is zero because it's a steady flow that's one of our assumptions let's go ahead and focus on the second term we'll focus first at the bottom left side so the velocity there again is v minus one half dv in the positive s hat direction so let's write that out I'm going to highlight this term in yellow just to reflect that it's this those yellow highlighted bits are the same thing okay now let's go ahead and continue to evaluate the mass flux term that's the rho times u rel our control volume surface is fixed so the relative velocity is just the fluid velocity here so that'll still be a v minus one half dv let me highlight that one in kind of a light green just to show that that's that those are the same terms now let's write out the area which we've done before this will be a minus a minus one half da that minus sign right here comes from the fact that the normal vector for that area is in a minus s hat direction we, we've talked about that already when we talked about conservation of mass so that is the linear momentum flux coming in from the bottom left side now let's think about the upper right hand side so the velocity there will be v plus one half dv so what we're doing now is we're focusing on this part of the control volume it's in a positive s hat direction let me go ahead and again highlight that one in yellow just so you can see which term it corresponds to and then we uh, have the mass flux term which will be v uh, density times v plus one half dv highlight that one in green just to emphasize which term it corresponds to and then the area there the area will be positive a plus one half da because the normal vector for that area is in the same direction as s hat so those that's our linear momentum flux term now let's focus on the body force term so the body force term will just include the weight of the uh, material inside the control volume so it's just this rho ds a times g now that's pointing in the minus z direction here what we really want it is in the s hat direction so there's a little bit of geometry you have to, or trigonometry you have to do there but it's not that tough and we'll I'll, I'll go ahead and write it out for you so the body force I'll just write up here will be the density times the volume which will be a times ds times the component of gravity in the s hat direction that'll be a minus g sine theta this is the component of gravity in the s direction so that's our body force term and now we have our surface force terms I'll write those over here so our surface forces will have the pressure force in the bottom left pressure force in the upper right and the pressure force around the sides now we don't have any viscous forces because we said that we're dealing with an inviscid flow this is an important part of Bernoulli's equation is that there are no viscous effects in here so all we have are the normal forces which would be just the pressure forces so let's write those down so on the bottom left we have P minus one half DP times a minus one half da and that's pointing in the positive s hat direction if you go back here the pressure force in blue is pointing in the positive s hat direction so on the upper right face that pressure force is pointing in the negative s hat direction so that'll be a minus P plus one half DP times a plus one half da and then the last bit we have pointing in the positive s hat direction will be the pressure around the sides which will be p times da all right so these are all the terms for our linear momentum equation in the s direction so now we need to go ahead and simplify that and as you can see you know there's a little bit of algebra involved and we also have some higher order terms that we can neglect Again, just thinking about these higher order terms imagine you have a very small number let's say 0 0.001 and you square it you multiply it by another small number 0 0.001 then you get 1 times 10 to the minus 6 
clearly 1 times 10 to the minus 6 is much smaller than 1 times 10 to the minus 3, the number you started with. So that when you have a d quantity squared, it's much smaller than the, the d quantity by itself. So that's why we neglect these higher order terms. So if we go ahead and simplify the linear momentum equation, and we make use of conservation of mass, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine conservation of mass with our expression from the linear momentum equation and do all that algebra. So let me write it all, let me go a little bit further down the screen here. So I'm going to combine all those together. So combine using algebra. It's nothing particularly hard, it's just tedious. What we'll end up getting in the end is dp over rho plus v dv plus g dz is equal to zero when you combine it all together. That equation is the differential form of Bernoulli's equation. So and you, the terms may look somewhat familiar to you. If you've taken a thermodynamics course, you've probably seen a, an equation similar to this. Okay, So that's the differential form. What we want to do now is let's integrate that whole equation. We're going to integrate it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate it along the stream tube. Or we usually kind of shorten that to say along a streamline. If you make the stream tube very, very small in diameter, it's essentially becoming a streamline. So we'll integrate it along the streamline. So I'll integrate along a streamline, one particular streamline. I'm going to integrate the entire equation. So the first part of the equation just becomes the pressure difference along that streamline. So it'll just be the pressure from, in fact, when I say along a streamline, I'm going to go from along a streamline, um, well, you know, I'll just leave it like that. So this will be P over rho. The rho is a constant, remember. We said that we were dealing with an incompressible flow, so the rho is just a constant. So the integral of dP is just P. The second term looks like a kinetic energy term, a one-half V squared. And then the last term looks like a potential energy term, plus GZ. I'm assuming that G remains constant along the streamline, which is a very good engineering assumption. And then the very last thing, the integral of zero, just is a constant. And this form, this is a very common form of Bernoulli's equation. So let's go ahead and just jot that down. Okay, so this is called Bernoulli's equation. And it's, again, one particular form of Bernoulli's equation. There are other forms that use different assumptions. They all assume inviscid flow, but as I mentioned before, our version of it, we're assuming steady flow, we're assuming incompressible flow and inviscid flow. And the other assumption that we have that we just made was it's along a streamline. The equation's only a valid along a particular streamline, one particular streamline. All right. In fact, let me re remind everyone the assumptions. So steady, incompressible, inviscid, and along a streamline. So Bernoulli's equation is often considered one of the most used and abused equations in fluid mechanics. It's used all the time. It's very helpful for connecting information about pressure and velocity. Just like what I described at the very beginning of this lecture for the race car, we could connect velocity to pressure and show some trends. You know, as the velocity goes up, the pressure goes down. So it's used all the time. But it's also one of the most abused equations in fluid mechanics because you have to make sure those assumptions are reasonable assumptions. There are four of them there. And you have to make sure they make sense, okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's why it's the most abused equation in fluid mechanics is because people use Bernoulli's equation sometimes when those assumptions aren't really all that valid. So it, 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 it'll give you a result, but it may not be the correct result if the assumptions aren't reasonable. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk some about the... Bernoulli's equation. First of all, let me just talk a little bit about the streamline idea. 
So when I say Bernoulli's equation is valid along a streamline, so let's draw a streamline. Looks like that. Let me put a point 1 here and a point 2 there along that streamline. So what Bernoulli's equation tells us is that the pressure plus the, the kinetic energy looking term plus the potential energy looking term, when you add that all up, it'll get a constant, and that'll be the same constant along that streamline. So I could write out, for example, P over rho plus 1 half B squared plus GZ is equal to a constant here, and I'll call this constant constant 1, 2. It's the same constant all the way along the streamline. So if I if I knew the pressure, velocity, and elevation at point 1, and I calculated the constant there, it'll be the same constant at point 2. right? So then P plus 1 half V squared plus GZ at point 2 will have that same value of the constant. However, if I have a different streamline, let me, let me draw a different one here. So this is a different streamline, and I have the points 3 and 4. There, I'll still have Bernoulli's equation, but the constant could be different. So there I'll call it constant 3, 4. So let me highlight that. These constants could be different constants. I could still use you know, Bernoulli's equation across, along this line because I, I could find the constant along that one. But that constant 3, 4 is not the same constant necessarily as from 1 to 2. So you can't use Bernoulli's equation to cross streamlines in general. You can only use it to move along a streamline for the derivation that we've, uh, that we've come up with. So that's one important thing. Another important thing about Bernoulli's equation is it looks kind of like a conservation of energy term expression, right? If you look at this for a moment, you've got a kinetic energy looking term, a potential energy looking term. The pressure term is like a pressure work. If you go back and remember from your thermodynamics days, you've got pressure work that has the same units of energy. So we've got, we've got a pressure work, kinetic energy, potential energy, add those together and it stays constant. That's like saying conservation of energy and throwing in the pressure work at the same time. Um, so that's that's kind of an interesting take on Bernoulli's equation. If you remember at the beginning of the lecture, I said that you could also get to Bernoulli's equation from the first law of thermodynamics, which is really an expression of, of conservation of energy. So you can sort of see where that comes from, right? All right, let me mention another thing about Bernoulli's equation. The form of Bernoulli's equation that you see most often in fluid mechanic or in mechanical engineering communities or civil engineering communities looks like this. It's just our Bernoulli's equation here, and all we've done is divide through by gravity. So they're the same equation, just we've divided through by gravity here. This is very common, this form, in, like I said, mechanical engineering and civil engineering. The terms in this form of Bernoulli's equation are called head terms. This is called the static pressure head, or just pressure head. This term is a velocity head. And the last term is an elevation head. Just historical names to this. And then the whole thing added together. So when you sum it all together, that's called the total head. So that's a common form of Bernoulli's equation, like I said, in civil engineering or mechanical engineering. You'll see it that way often. If you're dealing with aerodynamics, so primarily gas flows, then the form of Bernoulli's equation looks like this. You just multiply that previous equation through by uh, density times gravity. Oh, I forgot a row there. There's a row. So this is the form, same Bernoulli's equation, but this is the form that you'd see in aerodynamics. So again, this term is called a static pressure. Second term is the dynamic pressure. And the last term you've seen before, this is hydrostatic pressure. And then when you add it all together, it's just called the total pressure. So you'll hear those terms frequently. Now in aerodynamics, the hydrostatic pressure term is often very, very small. So this term is often neglected. So often neglected 
when working with gases because it's just so small in comparison to the other terms we don't normally worry about that one and we've talked about that before in other lectures all right so the very last thing I want to mention about Bernoulli's equation just goes back to these assumptions the the four assumptions steady flow incompressible flow inviscid flow along a streamline now in real engineering flows you always have some viscosity right so we never truly have a truly inviscid flow so could we still use Bernoulli's equation? Well, the answer is yes, you can still use Bernoulli's equation as long as the viscous effects are, viscous effects are small. They don't have to necessarily be exactly zero, but they should be negligible. They should be really, really small. So one way to get uh, small viscous forces is to have a very small velocity gradient. Remember that a viscous stress looks like tau times mu du dy. If you have a small velocity gradient, then you'll have a small viscous stress. So a small velocity gradient occurs when you have a more or less uniform velocity profile. So if this is the velocity and this is the y direction here, the du dy here is basically zero. It's very, very small. It's, there's no change in velocity with respect to the y direction. So that kind of a flow can be considered inviscid. It's very reasonably inviscid. Incompressible, if you're dealing with uh, flows of liquids, those are often modeled as being incompressible. If you have low speed flows of gases, those are often modeled as being inviscid or incompressible, excuse me. So those are both common worthwhile engineering assumptions. Steady flow, again, many flows are steady. There's very little time variation, or maybe there is some time variation, but it occurs over a long period of time. So the flow can be considered nominally steady over short time periods. So there are all kinds of engineering uh, situations where these assumptions are, are valuable or, or reasonable. Um, so we can still use Bernoulli's equation in many different situations. Now one way that I like to apply Bernoulli's equation, a very common way to do it, is to connect information from one location to another. So for, as an example of that, imagine we have a large tank and it's discharging out to the side. Let me go ahead and improve my picture here. So we have a tank and I want to find the velocity of the flow coming out and so the free surface of the tank is here. I can use Bernoulli's equation to find the velocity coming out. What I'll do is I'll connect a streamline from this point on the surface one to some streamline at point two here. There is some streamline, I don't know exactly where it is, but I know there's some streamline that goes from the free surface of the tank to point two because eventually the free surface, you know, if the, all the liquid flows out through that hole. Now I can apply Bernoulli's equation between those two points. Let me go ahead and write it out. And by the way, I'm assuming that z is, let me put the z coordinate system right in line with point two. I'm assuming z is acting upward and g is downward. I'm gonna say that the height of this tank is h at this instant in time. So since I'm dealing with Bernoulli's equation along that streamline, I have the same constant between points one and two. Let me go ahead and start writing down the information I know for this situation. So I already mentioned that uh, because of the coordinate system being in line with point two, z2 is gonna be zero and z1 is gonna be h. Let me go ahead and write out the pressure information. P1, pressure at one, it's right on the free surface here, so that'll just be atmospheric pressure. So I know some information there. P2 is right at the exit. Now, when you have flow, uh, a flow that's coming right out at the exit there, we call that a free jet. And where you have a free jet, the pressure in the jet will be the same as the surrounding atmospheric pressure. So P2 is actually also atmospheric pressure. That's an important boundary condition for you to keep in mind. Essentially, it's just saying that if I zoom in on that exit, so this is our point two right here, as the flow comes out, it's gonna have the same pressure as the surrounding atmospheric pressure right across the, the, the stream right there. So that'll be atmospheric pressure at two. The velocity at one, so the velocity right up here at that free surface, if the tank is large, the velocity, it's not zero, but it's gonna be small because the tank is coming down ever so slowly. So the velocity at one is approximately zero 
to within a, a very good approximation. And of course the velocity at two is unknown, so we want to find that. So what we're doing here is we're trying to we're connecting information where we we're connecting a point where we know information, like at point one, we know a lot of information, to a point where we want to get information, which is point two. We want to we want to know the velocity there. So I've used Bernoulli's equation to connect these two points to relate information from one to the other. If I go through the algebra on this, what you'll find is V2 comes out to be the square root of 2GH. You can see that we can use Bernoulli's equation to find the discharge velocity. And it's just related to the potential energy of the fluid in, in there. So you'll have lots of opportunity to practice Bernoulli's equation and a lot of different example problems. So make sure you take a look at those. We'll go ahead and end the lecture there. Um, just let me know if you have any questions about the material here.